everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise. I'm one half of the show. My name is Jeff. The other half of the show coming from an undisclosed location this week, it's uh, Mark A. Johnston. How are you doing? Hey, yes, oh. I'm coming from an undisclosed location. Well, <laughs> the dog pound, apparently, you got. <laughs> That's, yeah, I wasn't wearing my collar and I got, I got put in It's like the Arsenio Hall show. We got our own dog pound over here. Yeah, there he goes again. My apologies. That's Fred. Fred. He's got two sisters, Vilma and Daphne, uh, but they're being quiet. (laughs) Welcome, Fred. We always like new listeners. I I think I forgot to mention that if you are listening to this, this is uh, clearly your favorite uh, weekly baseball history podcast. I forgot to mention that. Yes. Because I haven't done well, that because be. I couldn't say weekly the last couple of times. So I, I kind of dropped it but I'll get back <laughs> in the habit of that. Good point. But yeah, welcome everybody. It is a uh, playoff time. Uh, I mean, it was playoffs last week when we talked, but it's deeper in the playoffs and I still have a team in the playoffs. I, I've kind of forgotten what this is like. Uh, the Mets just it's a fun, fun, fun postseason. How are you enjoying the postseason so far? It's been there's been some crazy games. I think Alonzo's home run was like ridiculous. That was just an incredible way, very well timed time, spot to hit a home run. We've been texting about it, and and one of the things we texted about was that we forget every year just how crazy playoff games are because they're not like yes. the regular season at all. No, it, it there's something about them that brings out the strangest in a player. Well, and, it, uh, it's because they don't it create they, heroes. They're not managed like a regular season game. Yeah, like you're lucky to get four innings out of your no. starter and then you don't mind having your relievers pitch like 17 days in a row. It's just really weird and leads to a lot of a lot yeah. of weird games. But we love it. I did want to ask you this question. By the way, we're in B, we're in our BP segment. We just kind of flow into it now. Just from here on out, assume that we're in BP when we start the show. But I want to know. Does anybody really like Alex Rodriguez? Does his mom <laughs> even like Alex Rodriguez? I I don't know what this That point. is a good question. Well, so he's on the pregame, I think it's Fox, and they do their pregame show on the field. They were doing this in LA before the first game against the Dodgers and the Mets. And they're on the field in the pregame. It's A Rod, David Ortiz, and Derek Jeter are sitting at this table with whoever was hosting it. And it was in that order. First of all, you notice that they're separating A-Rod and Jeter, who we all know are not great friends anymore. But at two separate points, while they're live on the air, players come over to say hi to David Ortiz. First of all, uh, Mookie Betts comes over and kind of gives him a hug from behind. They were teammates. So, okay, they totally cool. Manny Ramirez, who was throwing out the first pitch at this game, comes over and does the same thing, hugs Big Poppy from behind uh, live. Uh, both Mookie and, and Manny acknowledge Jeter, and then they left without even looking at A-Rod. He's just sitting there with his ears, which are literally as big as his entire head because of the steroids, if you've noticed that. <laughs> the top of his ear is at the top of his head, and the bottom of his ear is a little bit below his chin. Like, they're huge. Does steroids make your ears grow? Yes. Yes, they oh, do. Uh, it, I wasn't aware of that. In the Chinese culture, it they think it means you're going to live long. But I think if you get that way through steroids, it's probably less so. Everything in your head grows. Can you can you hear better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I that, that I do not know. But he's beyond these ears. He's got that big fake smile that in his teeth are just like. You remember that episode of Friends where Ross gets his teeth whitened and they like glow in the dark? That's what I think of when I see A Rod with that big fake smile and he's he's pretending like it's a joke and he's in on it that nobody's acknowledging him and that oh these guys are joking around with me because I'm A Rod. Oh, I hate him. I hate him. Well, don't don't hold back, Jeff. I won't. But I do want to say Brian Anderson with TBS. I mm-hmm. th- he is so good. Like I agree. I, he is the 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 play-by-play voice on TV of the Brewers, which I never hear him unless it's the playoffs cuz I'm not watching Brewers home broadcasts ever. But every season, every postseason, I guess, I get reminded of how good he is. And I saw that he just re-upped for like 5 more years with TBS or TNT whatever, but that's good news because I, he is really good at baseball. 
He does other yeah, things too. Yeah, I, I have. I, I enjoy his play by play, and I don't think he goes over the top. Uh, or and but of course he's not boring either. So yeah, he's a fun one. Yeah, uh, and he's with Ron Darling, uh, Jeff Francoeur. I can I can take or leave, but Ron Darling obviously is part of the best booth in baseball that I love to talk about. Uh, they, they're just they're really good. But the, the Dodgers, though, how about this pitching staff? I mean, they had 33 consecutive scoreless innings over over the series with the, the Padres and then the first game with the Mets. 33 consecutive scoreless innings in the postseason. That's pretty, pretty impressive. It's unbelievable. But <laughs> their previous 33 innings, they had allowed 22 runs. So they were kind of evening it up to they allow about 11 runs over 33 innings. Over their last sixty six, I guess. Yes, the the scoreless streak was reminiscent of Oral Hershiser himself. Uh, yeah, let's not. Why are we got to bring eighty eight up? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it was quite a feat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. So uh, we talk about baseball here. I guess it's what is expected on a baseball history podcast. But we do talk about other baseball adjacent sports or just weird stuff which is leaves a pretty wide swath for us to, to fill. But have you ever heard of Conkers? C-O-N-K-E-R. No, Conkers. I have not. So is this is... second baseman? <laughs> Hank Conker. He was a catcher for the Angels. Hank Conker. Oh, no, yeah, I've yeah. heard of him, but... <laughs> so I guess it's not a... I don't want to call it a sport. Let's call it a contest where you do the, you take a chestnut and this is big. Well, I don't know if it's big, but it, I guess it originated in the UK, which, Hey, so did baseball. So we can make that correlation, but you take a chestnut and you bore a hole in it. And I guess conquer is a nickname for a chestnut. And then you tie a piece of string. Usually these are kids doing this. So it's like a shoelace about eight inches long. You put it through that. You knot both ends so that you can swing this thing around, which if I knew how to do this and had a chestnut as a child, I would have done this and hurt a lot of people, including myself, I'm sure. But what they do is then they take turns hitting each other's conquer using their own. So one just holds it up there by the shoelace and just holds it stationary. And then you swing your chestnut or conquer and you try and hit it. And you do that until somebody's chestnut breaks. And a point is scored. The surviving chestnut goes on and tries to break the next one. And you're the champ until somebody breaks yours. And uh, let me tell you something. A broken chestnut is painful. (laughs) Well, if you're the Mariners and you have a broken chestnut, you'll get sent to Modesto. (laughs) Every time. But so this is a this is not just a schoolyard game. They have tournaments here and championships of which recently 82-year-old David Jenkins, who has been competing in this contest for 47 years, finally Jeez. won his first championship. Wow. Talk 40, about never giving up. That's that, half as a Mariners his, fan, that excites me. <laughs> that's half his life he's been swinging chestnuts at people. But this is what happened. After he claimed the championship, he was found to have a metal conquer. In oh, his no. pocket. It was painted. It looked exactly like a, a real chestnut, but was obviously heavier and harder and is not going to crack. <laughs> right. So Jenkins, who was also responsible for drilling and inserting strings into all of the other competitors' chestnut, because he was the judge. Ah. <laughs> but... After after he won. By the way, he's also named as he's also known as the King Conquer. Because I, I guess see. he's been doing this song. And he dresses. He doesn't come in a sweatsuit or anything. He does these things dressed up like the Lucky Charm Leprechaun. But his green suit and hat are all bedazzled with chestnuts. <laughs> oh, so, man, I got to not look this up. Yeah, well, I'm telling you all you need to know about it. There's an investigation yes. underway. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll be sure to keep everybody updated with any news on the matter. You can also check out, I've just launched another uh, All Conquer podcast called Swingin' Nuts, where you can, <laughs> you can get this information as well if you're, if you're interested. 
Yeah, I can't wait to hear that one. When does uh, episode one come out? Oh, it's, it's just dropped. So this has got more information like this. So just wherever you get your podcast, swinging nuts. So Go. let me just say, if you're hearing this, don't Google swinging nuts. I'm just saying. All right. I went down a rabbit hole this week, Mark, and I got caught up in baseball songs that I'd never heard of. And I wanted to share some of these songs that I found. We've kind of done this in the past. It's, we get some interesting songs you didn't know happened. First, I found this this band called Wolf. It's like Wolf, but with a V. And yeah. the song is called One for One DiMaggio. And I'll just I'll play you a little bit here before we discuss it too much. 1998, it's the world's sillies, including I with my dad at Joe Table. Well, he blew it. So, so now I root for the New York Yonkels with Bartoli Cologne. He's throwing 101 in the ninth inning. Well, he's the best. Come on. One. DiMaggio. Perfect streak. This one. So I don't know if I like this or not. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> first of all, it's about Joe DiMaggio, but they drop a 1998 Cleveland Indians reference with Joe Table in there at, wow. the, at the beginning, which I Joe Table reference. I'm going to give him give him props for that. They seem to be sampling the Jackson five. And what I thought they were going to do is I thought they were going to go through Joe DiMaggio's entire 56-game hit streak saying what he did at the plate each game during the streak because they did a couple of games of what sounded like his line score from each game. But instead, they ranted about the 1998 baseball season. I mean, it would be a great idea if if somebody did do a song with every game from his 56-game hitting streak. If somebody could get on that, we'll play it. Yeah, we're we're all over that. It, when this song first, the the part you first played, it sounded like a beat poet. We do have a poetry slam podcast as well. You can check out. <laughs> yes, we, it goes with our rounders uh, podcast. Well, I, this is kind of the rounders. They're podcast. hand in hand. But no, we do have a rounders podcast where we break down minute by minute the Matt Damon uh, rounders movie about poker. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested, that's a great. Yeah, that's where I was going way. with that. Anyway, okay, but back to more baseball songs. Only vaguely related to baseball, but also mo- maybe more importantly related to Seinfeld and baseball. So on brand for us, I found a band called Isotopes Punk Rock Baseball Club. I nice. found them because they w- the song that I found them through was called The Ballad of Ray Ordonez. Uh, I found another one called The Curse of Jim Eisenreich. So these guys are obviously baseball fans, right? Uh, Yeah, yeah, definitely. These two songs were okay. Nothing I felt I needed to share here. But as I was looking through the rest of their catalog, there was a song called Rochelle Rochelle, which if you've watched Seinfeld as much as we have, you know that it's probably a movie about a young woman's strange erotic journey from Milan to Minsk. And you would be correct. Rochelle Rochelle. I mean, I just said that, but they just sang it. But I, I, I love this band. I like, I like punk in the first place. But this led me to some of their other songs, one of which is called The Invisible Hand of the MLB is Meddling. Now, <laughs> beyond the grammatical error of saying the MLB, which I'll let it slide in this case, this song is brilliant. It First of all, it's about greedy Major League Baseball owners, and the lead singer is wearing an A's hat throughout the entire video. But this song is four years old, by the way. It's not like they just came out with it this year because of the, the sentiment from this season and the last season here in Oakland. But these guys knew, uh, they knew what was going on, And uh, I had to know if they were from the Bay Area. I thought maybe they were. I had not heard of them. But it turns out they're actually from Canada. So, I don't know, maybe they were Expo fans and got mad, you know. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, I looked up their Wikipedia page, and I'm not sure. Well, actually, I am because I kept reading this. But there's about 17,000 members that have played in this group at one point. They go through a lot of different... (laughs) 
a lot of different members of the band, but they all take on personas when they are in this band. So a couple of the current members are Dallas Dust Storm, Trevor Uppercuts, Rad Jockstrap, who is my favorite. Uh, you got Tony Hustle, Andy A Bomb, uh, Mikey Batcracks. Some of the other guys that have uh, cycled through here, Danny Diamond, Cutter Sharp, Ricky Sensation, gotcha. Dylan Dinger. Uh, there's some good, and Ricky Rochelle, which I'm guessing he was on the Rochelle Rochelle, but some good names here. Their, their albums are Nuclear Strike Zone, and the other one that they uh, dropped in 2017 is called 1994 World Series Champions. I guess they're from Canada, so. Ah, yes. Some of their songs are the Cuban Missile, Heat Seeker, Lead Off, Total Juice Head. So everything seems to be about baseball from these guys. And I found uh, another one of their songs, which is titled The Legend of George Brett, in which the video, because they made a video for it, is almost a shot-for-shot remake of the Bohemian Rhapsody scene in Wayne's World, where they're driving in the car singing Bohemian Rhapsody. And uh, my favorite line from this song is, is, quote, it's not a party unless your pants have been destroyed. Which, of course, is something that happened to George Brett. But what is just so great, um, they equate this song to that that opening scene from Wayne's World, but they make it all about baseball. So the scene in Wayne's World where Wayne is thirsting, I guess, over the guitar and says, it will be mine. Oh, yes, it will be mine. Well, this is uh, this is how they uh, turn that into a song. Stop torturing yourself, man. You can't tar the barrel of a stick like that. It's made of ash. People will see it. You'll get busted. Live in the now. It will be mine. Oh, yes, it will be mine. So instead of thirsting over a guitar, he's thirsting over a bat that he wants to put pine tar on. It's, nice. it's good. I, I'll put all the links in the show notes. You can watch the video, especially if you like Wayne's World, which I I love Wayne's World one and Tia Carrere. But if you want to watch that, you can you can see the similarities. They did a good job. Mark, this show is debuting on October 18th. Now, there are no debuts that we are going to talk about here today, but there are a couple of things that happened uh, in baseball today sometime throughout the history that we do want to talk about. First of all, 1950, at the ripe age of 87, Connie McGillicuddy Mack finally retires as the manager of the Philadelphia Athletics after 50 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's hard to get fired when you own the team. Connie Mack, along with Ben Scheib, who I am just, I'm taking a stab that Scheib Park was named after him where the Philadelphia Athletics played. But he and Ben Scheib founded the Athletics in 1901. Wouldn't that have been 49 years if my math? I mean, I want to. Mm, You got to count 01. Okay. You know what? Hey, I went to Washington State. I'll take your word for it. (laughs) Also, today, October 18th, 1977, Reggie Jackson hits three consecutive home runs to lead the New York Yankees to an 8-4 victory over the Los Angeles Dodgers and give the Yankees the World Series title in six games. Three home runs, three consecutive pitches. Three pitches, three home runs. That's the amazing thing. One of the great playoff performances or postseason performances of all time. Yeah, well, you would think that the third time up, why are you throwing him a strike on the first pitch? I wouldn't have. Of course, I can't throw strikes. Well, (laughs) then you would have been set. I would have brought you in without hesitation to throw one pitch to Reggie Jackson uh, (laughs) at that point. Uh, Jackson was at that point, the second player to have hit three home runs in a world series game. Babe Ruth having done it twice himself, of course, in 1926. And then again in 1928, since Jackson did it, two other players have also hit three home runs in a single world series game. That being Albert Pujols in 2011 and Pablo Sandoval. I don't know why that sounded so weird. I get I I think I just call him Panda all the time. So when I say his full name, it sounds weird in my head. It, the next year in 2012, but uh, like we said, three consecutive pitches. Nobody has done that in the World Series. I doubt anybody will ever. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. 
All right, that's going to do it for our BP segment. We're going to let the ground crew come out and do their stuff. It's the World Series, so or not the World Series, it's the playoffs. So they're they've got to repaint all the ads on the foul territory. And oh yeah, that's always fun. They got to, I will say they are putting in the cameras uh, in the dirt right in front of the bases. I'm all for that. Those are some really cool shots. So we'll let them do that. But that being said, last week, Mark, we talked about the uh, passing of a legend, Louis Tiant, and we promised that this week we were going to talk about Louis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to you to start out with. Well, I was just I was uh, gonna talk about. Louis Tiant's um, statistics and some of the impressive things that he did over his career kind of gets forgotten. And uh, he was, you know, he's not vo- voted into the Hall of Fame. And there, there are reasons for that. People don't remember Louis Tiant for some of these amazing things he did. And so I thought I'd bring him out and, and uh, just in, in honor of the man, talk about some of his stuff. One thing that I found is that uh, Cleveland signed him in 61. They sent him to the minors. He was playing in the Pacific Coast League in 64. He pitched 17 games and went 15 and 1. <laughs> I, I want to know about the, the game that he lost. Right. <laughs> that just, I was like, he did what? I mean, to get a decision, 16 decisions in 17 games? Well, let's see. He started that year 17, or he started 15. Oh, it doesn't say how many he finished. I was going to say he probably finished every game. Oh, he was a complete game guy. Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit, too. Um, well, let, just a quick note on that 64 season with uh, the with the Beavs. He pitched 137 innings. He only gave up 88 hits and struck out 154 batters. That is crazy. That is mad. Yeah. Well, he he did get to the big leagues that year. Shocking and, that they would have yeah, called him up. Yeah, when he's 15, they didn't call him up when he was 12 and 1, for goodness sakes. So 15 and 1 will get you a call up. But he had a, a great year in 66 where he led the American League in shutouts. Five shutouts, including four in a row, which was pretty impressive. And then I was looking at 68. He went 21 and 9 and led the league in earn run average with 1.60 ERA. And nine shutouts that year, 264 strikeouts. So pretty decent right there. It was in uh, 68 that he came up with his delivery. You know, if you're not familiar with Louis Tion, just look him up real quick. A video, he basically turned his back to the batter as he wound up like a corkscrew. It made him very hard to see the ball. He had a, a lot of injuries in 1969. He went 9-20. and 20. They let him lose 20 games. I thought you didn't want your guy to lose 20 games. It was a different time. You stop him at 19, don't well, pitch him anymore. It's funny because if you look at his black ink on his baseball reference page, everything is very impressive except for 69 where he led the league in losses. He led the league in home runs allowed and walks. He walked 129 batters to lead the league. He never walked more than 82 at any other point in his career. Amazing. So it, whatever he did to come up with that corkscrew, it sure worked because he had lost it in 69. Something was wrong. Yeah. Some, he, there was a lot of injuries at the time back then. It got him released by the, the twins that signed him, and then they, they released him. He signed a minor league deal with the Red Sox, and uh, he went one and seven. However, when he turned 31, that would be in 1972, He started just becoming a Red Sox hero. He won an average of 17 games a year from 72 through 78. That's good, right? I'm pretty doggone impressive. Not a big baseball guy, but I, I assume that's good. He was, he was known as a very clutch pitcher. Daryl Johnson, former Red Sox manager said, if a man put a gun to my head and said, I'm going to pull the trigger. If you lose this game, I'd want Louis Tiant to pitch that game. That's pretty impressive. 1975, he went to the ALCS against your beloved A's. They swept the three games, swept it in three, and then they went up against the Reds, of course, in 75. He threw a five-hit shutout in game one. And then in game four, he came out and threw 163 pitches (laughs) and won by a score of five to four. (laughs) So pretty impressive. He also started game six, I believe. Because there were a couple of days of rain in between. 
And so that was when the Fisk homered in the 12th inning and forced game seven. He actually threw, he didn't have his best stuff, but he, he got through seven innings that night, giving up six runs. And of course, Cincinnati won game seven. Uh, sorry, Red Sox fans for bringing that up, but we're talking about the good and the bad. When was the last um, time, I, I'm interested to know when the last time the Reds were in the World Series and didn't win it. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll, I'll look it up. I'm not I'm not so interested that I'm going to look it up now while we're recording, but for next week I'll I'll look up and see when cuz the last two times I think they've they've won, right? Yes, I believe so. He uh well Tion went to the Yankees after that as this this Red Sox and Yankees players sometimes flip. Very incestual know? if I if Yeah, I it's can. very interesting. It's like I'm going to go play for my worst enemy. I don't know. Anyway, he Pitched a couple of years, one with the Pirates, one with the Angels. Career-wise, 229 and 172 with a 3.30 earned run average. 187 complete games, folks. 187 complete games. Unbelievable, including 49 shutouts. There might not even be 187 complete games in baseball from now until the day I die. Right? <laughs> for a decade. Yeah. What, I'm only going to live for another 10 years? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I I wouldn't know, man. I, I don't claim to be. I would, uh, I would take that if, if, if I could assure that. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. How about that? 49 shutouts career. Led the AL and earn run average twice and in shutouts three times. And I'll finish this, uh, my part of this with uh, Jim Palmer's quote. When the chips are on the line, Louis Tion is the greatest competitor I've ever seen. Very cool. And he got a good mustache. Like, he's got a two-tenths of a point mustache in Wax Packs Heroes. Absolutely. Yeah, good good, good looking uh, facial hair there. So, I got a couple of things. So, Mark was responsible for the factual part of, uh, of Louis Tion. I am more responsible for the what did he do off the field kind of stuff. First of all, I guess we should mention the cigars. <laughs> yes. Yes. Known for smoking cigars. Always. I mean, he is Cuban. He is from Cuba. Yes. And he was signed while I was reading up on him. He was signed before any of the embargo stuff in Cuba. And then he came and played in the minor leagues. And while he was in the minor leagues, that's when the relations with Cuba went south. And he eventually just he couldn't go home. He didn't see his family. I think it was 14 years. He never yeah. saw his family. But he is Cuban. His father, also Louis Tiant, also played uh, professionally. But he always has cigars, whether they be in his pocket when he's getting ready to smoke one or he's got one already in there. I found this great quote from uh, who we are going to now refer to as Baseball Hall of Fame political prisoner Tommy John. <laughs> Yes. See, see last week's show if you don't know. Poor it, Tommy. If you don't understand that. But he said, quote, he could even take a shower and keep his stogie going. In the confined space of a bus, that smoke would gag you. He'd fall asleep <laughs> on the bus, but the scar would somehow stay alive all night long, end quote. <laughs> Which is uh, it's funny. Isn't that uh, dangerous to fall asleep with a... A cigarette or a cigar in your mouth. But in a, in a gas-powered vehicle? No, nah, I'm uh, sure it's fine. This is Louis Tiant we're talking about, though, so he <laughs> knows what he's doing. Also competed in the Senior Professional Baseball Association in 1989, one of our favorite leagues. He initially was signed by the Winter Haven Super Sox. I mean, that nobody really thought that he was going to fit in with Super Sox. So he was traded to the Gold Coast Suns, which everybody, they thought that's where he should have started out. It was I mean, a much better fit. Yeah, we all know that. But And we've talked about this. He was traded in exchange for outfielder Ralph Gar and 500 Teddy Ruxpins. <laughs> hey, Teddy Ruxpins were nothing to shake a stick at. Back oh, then. they were huge, right? And it, these 500 Teddy Ruxpins, they were for a fan giveaway. I mean, remember Teddy Ruxpins were like, it was the It toy one year. You couldn't find them in toy stores. And they're giving them away? I Yeah. I, maybe this was after the initial rush. I don't know. That's, you know, you're getting I, traded for Teddy Ruxpins. You know, I worked seven years in a toy store. I did not go through the Teddy Ruxpin phase, but I did go through the Tickle Me Elmo craze. Oh, God. That, which was very similar. That must have been awful to have to hear that laugh, like, all day long. No, not really, because we were always out. Oh, okay. I didn't have any. Did you ever put them aside when they would come in and buy them yourselves and then <laughs> jack up the price on the, on the black market? That I never did. We would have gotten 
in uh, big trouble for that sort of us, thing. One of us might have done that with with Beanie Babies. One of <laughs> us. I'm not saying it was me. It could have been you. Don't well, know. I once bribed a loan officer when I was uh, refinancing my house with a Nintendo 64. And it worked. <laughs> okay, now I think that one is actually illegal. So we'll... <laughs> I don't know what the statute of limitations is on that, but we got uh, a really good rate. Yeah, so this is the uh, this is my favorite Louis Tian uh, thing off the field here. Appeared in an episode of Cheers in the nice. first season. Uh, the episode was titled "Now Pitching Sam Malone," which first aired on January sixth, nineteen eighty three. This was the first season of Cheers. And, uh, of course, there are Cheers podcasts, and I went and listened to a couple that did an episode on this very episode. And uh, what the premise is, is that Sam Malone is approached to do a, a beer commercial. He's thrilled that somebody wants him to <laughs> recognize him and wants him to do a commercial. So he's doing this commercial with Louis Tiant, who, of course, is a larger than life in Boston. And uh, Louis Tiant starts out the commercial talking about this fictitious beer, but he starts to uh, starts to lose it because even all those complete games you talked about, this is at the end of his career. So uh, he's probably not going to go for complete games. It's a little bit long. I, comedy writing in the early 80s, not very tight after having watched this episode. But <laughs> here's the uh, commercial with Louis Tiant and uh, Sam Malone. And now for Fields Light Beer, former Red Sox starting pitcher, Luis Tian. After the game, I like to sit back, light up a cigar, and enjoy a Field Light Beer. Hey, Luis. Hey, Sam. When you get to be my age, 30, you don't want to get filled up. That's why I drink a Field Beer. It's refreshing. It's satisfying, and you don't fulfill with fear. You just feel fine. Fulfill with fear. You just feel fine. Sorry, Luis. I don't think you've got it today. I'm going to have to pull you. Hey, Skip, let me stay. Sorry, big guy. Now pitching, Sam Mayday Malone. Fields. It's refreshing. It's satisfying. And you don't feel full with fields. You just feel fine. Hey, all right. Another say. I still get the wing, don't I? <laughs> so, first of all, no, you weren't having a stroke. I mean, he just, he was slurring his words there that's why he got pulled but my favorite part is is, if this whole thing is the throwaway line at the end uh, because the commercial itself isn't really funny but the tagline at the end (laughs) louis says i still get the win right (laughs) (laughs) i guess i I don't really have anything else to say (laughs) But it was fun. I'm not going to lie to watch an episode of Cheers. It was it still stood up. I mean, the tropes of the characters that were not regulars on the show are very cliche. This is 1983. So I, it's kind of what you expect. But there were like coach is hilarious. But there you go. Yeah. So Louis Tian also a uh, part time actor, I guess. I don't know. I know he's <laughs> sure. appeared on some and it, I know he's appeared on some Nesson like pregame shows uh, as well with a cigar in hand. In Waxbacks Heroes, he would get a uh, bonus point for pop culture. Oh, yeah. No def- oh, you're on Cheers. Yeah. All right. So that's it for Louis Tian. R.I.P. to him. I did meet him once. Not met him, but I like shook his hand. He was a pitching coach in uh, when I was at school at Washington State. We'd go up to Spokane. And watch, I think that was single A ball, but he was the pitching coach there. And I knew the name. I didn't know a whole lot about him, but I knew his name and I knew the cigars and the motion and stuff. So I got to shake his hand during BP, which I don't really know. Really cool. You know, I'm, I've touched his hand. I've washed you it since. You shake hands with a legend, man. Yeah, I've, I've washed it since, but yeah. All right, that's going to do it for the main segment of the show. Let's get into the final part of the show. Mark, this is, I mean, this is embarrassing for you. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> Thanks, talking, man. we're talking about Wax Packs Heroes. Looking at the scoreboard, it is 11 to 6. I mean, I am rolling. I am going to start all of my subs today. Not even worried about it anymore. We play first to 20. We also play this song before we start. Wax Packs. All right, 
If you are new here, this is what we're going to do. We've got some baseball cards. We've still got some left over from uh, Mark's brother was nice enough to, one, acknowledge that he was Mark's brother, but B, give us some cards to to play with. So what we're going to do is we are going to use the rest of those. They are from 1990. They are Topps branded baseball cards. And what we're going to do is we're going to play essentially war against each other, card versus card, card e card Mano y mano. We're going to take the baseball reference war of said card and compare them to each other. Whoever has the highest wins that round, first one to five. But there are some things that can add to that score. And those are things that we call general 80s baseball aesthetics. That means real stirrups where we can see sanitary socks, anything on the face, essentially. Big science teacher glasses that they're blind without, flip down or any kind of sunglasses, eye black if an earring makes an appearance we'll give it you know give you an extra point for that brady anderson's sideburns make an appearance we'll give you an extra point for that also if uh you're wearing a mustache or have grown one I, if you're wearing one you've got those glasses with the nose and, and mustache that's we'll give you extra bonus points for that but extra tenth of a point for all of those things unless it's a louis tiantesque mustache we'll give you an even extra tenth of a point on top of that. Uh, If you're wearing things like two-in-ones or stuff that we don't like, we will subtract a tenth of a point. If the card bearer, not bearer, the card, the subject of the card, how about we put it that way, won an award in 1990. That means Rookie of the Year, Cy Young, MVP game, MVP game, MVP, if they made the All-Star game or won a gold glove, you get a half a point. If there's a Hall of Famer on the card, even if they're not the focus, you get a whole point. If Ricky Henderson or Nolan Ryan show up, regardless of who has that card, if Ricky shows up, I win the round. If Nolan Ryan shows up, Mark wins the round. Any pop culture references that we can easily find, half a point each. So like Louis Tiant, there's Cheers episode. You're going to get that for half a point. But if they appeared in an episode of Seinfeld, The Simpsons, or Sabrina the Teenage Witch, you're going to get a whole point for each of those. And if they were suspended during their playing career or appeared in the Mitchell Report, you are going to minus a point. So, Mark, we've got these cards from 1990. I think uh, you've got them because I don't see them here on my desk. So I'm going to have you. I have them right here. They're dealt out, ready to go. You just got to choose left or right. Uh, I'm sticking with uh, the my my date who brought me. I'm going to go with the left. All right. So you're going to start off with... Cincinnati Reds shortstop Mariano Duncan from, of course, San Pedro de Macri in the Dominican Republic. And yeah, of course, he was on the, you know, the 1990 Reds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, can we get rid of the Reds? Really? Just once. Let's see. Mariano Duncan, 12 years in the big leagues, four with the Dodgers, four with the Reds, four with the Phillies, two with the Yankees, and one with Toronto, his final year in the big leagues. In 1990, well, good news for me, he led the league in triples with 11. Uh, also hit, wow, 306 with a 345 on base, 10 home runs, 55 RBI, 13 stolen bases, and a 120 OPS plus. And that is good for a war of 2.4 which is pretty good. Anything else on that car can help me out? Uh, Let me see. Yeah, he's got a wisp of a mustache there. You got to count it. All right. Well, you know. It looks like real stirrups, my man. Oh, I like that even more. I kind of put him down for being on the 1990 Reds. He did not do a whole lot to help them sweep the A's. In the, he played in all four games. He hit 143 with the 250 on base. Also won a World Series in 96 with the Yankees. And uh, traded for Cal Daniels and Lenny Harris at one point. So he's got that going for him. He had uh, 10 brothers and sisters. Wow. So he could play. He could literally field his own team. Yeah. I I mean, I can see his dad. We we can't stop at five. I'm not a basketball player. (laughs) We got to go to nine at least. Uh, Let's see. Played one year in Japan for the Yamaguri Giants in 1998. Oh, it says he he was a switch hitter between 85 and 87. Yes, just for three years, and then he batted uh, right-handed after that. All right. Well, whatever works for you. All right, so that'll be a 2.6 to start out with for Mariano. What about your card? Well, I think we have a classic 90s matchup here, a National League matchup uh, facing Mariano Duncan would be Joe McGrain. 
Let's see, Joe McGrain. How did he not do commercials for like uh, Tylenol or what? Excedrin. Excedrin. Yeah, yeah that was an eighties brand. <laughs> well, I guess they were kind of. They had some bad publicity. I guess Excedrin with the whole poisoning and people dying. But yeah, uh, Joe McGrain. <laughs> Overall, eight years in the big league, six with the Cardinals, two with the Angels, one with the White Sox in 1990 with St. Louis. Let's see, 10 and 17 with the 3.59 ERA, 203 innings pitched, 204 hits allowed, and 100 strikeouts for a 106 ERA plus. And that is good for a war of 2.4. So I ended up with a 2.6. Anything on that card going to help you out? I cannot tell if his stirrups are real or not, so I just have to say no. Okay. And no no mustache or anything like that. Uh, I'm looking for any 80s aesthetics. Nothing. No, nope, mm-hmm. nothing else. Uh, let's see. Overall first-round draft pick by the Cardinals, 18th <laughs> overall in the 1985 draft. Now, I don't know. Maybe Joe McGrain uh, did a lot of commercial work or appeared in uh, primetime sitcoms during his career. I just don't remember. Well, we'll have sure. to. Sure. Look, his daughter, well, I think we've had him before. His daughter was a finalist on American Idol in the 11th season. But I I don't think that really counts as (laughs) pop culture. (laughs) So uh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the points for the stirrup. We'll just say they're real. Okay. They look. They look like they're real. Okay. Because it's too skinny to be a two in one, but you can't tell for sure. All right. So that'll bring you up to 2.5, but I had a 2.6. So, yeah. Great. That's that's too bad for you. All right. That was a very good 90s uh, NL matchup, though. Yeah. I mean, we could hold on one second here. Here's what we're going to do we're going to see what they did against each other. Nice. All right. Well, I, I, I've i looked it up here. They faced each other 22 times. And uh, Mariano Duncan hit 300 off of him with a 300 Ooh. on base, one home run, one strikeout. So mm, eh. that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to take the win either way. Uh, all right. Round two. Round two. Uh, we got you uh, a uh, Seattle Mariners pitcher. Oh, boy. You got to be excited. Gene Harris. I, I remember Gene Harris. I think it's his 87 tops when he was on the Red Sox. He's got, I think he's in Fenway during BP and he's got that like sateen jacket on that <laughs> everyone used to wear. But let's see. Gene Harris, overall seven years in the big leagues. Seattle for four, the Padres for three, and then parts of seasons with Philadelphia, Montreal, Baltimore, and Detroit. In 1990, in Seattle, Appeared in 25 games, went 1-2 and with a 4.74 ERA, 38 innings, 31 hits allowed, 43 strikeouts. Wow. 84 ERA plus, and that is good for a war of minus .6. That's rough. Well, he's a Mariner pitcher in 1990. I don't know what I was expecting. Uh, Anything on that card going to help me out? Can't really. Yeah, he's got a mustache. All right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll take anything I can get. Let's see. Overall, fifth round draft pick by the Expos. He was traded by the Expos. Yes. To the Mariners with Brian Holman and Randy Johnson for Mark yes. Langston. And Langston left the next year as a free agent. I would say that uh, the the Mariners got the better end of this deal. I don't know. I don't know if history will agree with me or not. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and say that they won that round. Kind of funny, the uh, when the Mariners went to try and re-sign him, his uh, agent actually told the Mariners that he was going to quit baseball and pursue a career in the National Football League. Mark Langston? No. Or Randy Gene Johnson. Harris. Oh, okay. So we're, we're not talking, we're talking about the card, not the actual yes. big names involved in this trade. Had 23 saves for the Padres in 93. Uh, oh, well, good for him. Nothing in terms of pop culture for me, so... That's not going to help me out. So that'll be a minus 0.5 for me. So really, you just got to have anybody that was just an average player. Well, I, you may have hit the nail on the head as a player. First baseman, Mr. Terry Francona. Sorry, Milwaukee Brewer at this point. Okay, yeah, Terry uh, Tito here. Let's see. Overall, 10 years in the big leagues. Five with Montreal, two with Milwaukee, 
one with Cleveland, Cincinnati, the Cubs. Your new manager of the Cincinnati Reds, by the way. That's right. Just named last week. Let's see. 1990 was his final year in the big leagues. Oh he boy. appeared in three games, had four at-bats, <laughs> and one run scored. That is it. Oh OPS boy. plus of minus 100. I think what that means is he was the worst player to appear in the big leagues that year. Well, that's hardly fair. He barely played. Well, yeah, but still, his war was only minus 0.1. So somehow he was better than Gene Harris, who actually <laughs> pitched and allowed fewer base hits than innings pitched. See, you would have hit, you would have, if you had Gene Harris in that situation. You know, if he didn't pitch that year, you probably would have won. Probably would have, yeah, if you'd have been injured. Let's see, first round draft pick, 22nd overall by the Expos in 1980. Uh, Of course, part of the family of baseball, Tito's, his uh, father, Tito Francona, played for 15 years from uh, 1956 to 1970. Let's see, I, I don't know, is there any real pop culture about Tito... I mean, he's won a World Series or two, but, you know, that's not pop culture. Broadcasting replaced a former guest of the show, Bobby Valentine, on the Sunday Night Baseball. Yeah, I don't see anything really pop culture related. I know he would ride his scooter to the stadium every day in Cleveland until one day somebody stole his scooter. And that (sighs) was big news. And they eventually caught the culprit and he got his... He got his scooter back. But congrats to you. You win that round. 1-1. Yeah, 1-1. And I think I might have a shot at this one, too, since you got a manager card. Okay. Royals manager and manager who led them to the World Series in 85, Dick Hauser. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think we give points for for managers. I and, well, true. Mm-hmm. I if if he's got any aesthetics or anything that we give additional points to, and then if you've got a, a Greg Harris that. Shows up with a minus (laughs) 0.6. Well, he's got those big, huge sunglasses on. So there you go. All right. So I got a tenth of a point at least. Looking at Dick Hauser as a player, first of all, eight years in the big leagues, four with Cleveland, three with the Royals, two with the Yankees. He played from 1961 to 1968. His rookie season in 1961, he was an all-star and came in second in rookie of the year balloting behind Don Schwal. (laughs) <laughs> pitcher for the Red Sox. But oh, uh, let's see, overall for his playing career, he ended up with a war of 9.3. Here's a little Mark A. Johnston trivia here for you about Dick Hauser. I once had three kittens that my family rescued and raised and gave away, but me and my buddy Jason named them Meathead, Bonehead, and Dick Hauser. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where, where does Meathead and, and what head? Bonehead. Bonehead. And then Dick Hauser. What's the what's the correlation between the three? No clue. We're just weird kids. No. Okay. Well, that's why you're here. As a manager, he also managed the Yankees for two years. Overall, as a manager, 507 wins, 425 losses. And as you mentioned, the World Series in 1985. But uh, all right. So I've got I've got a half or I've got a tenth of a point positive. So who's your guy? I, I may have you here because I have uh, Cleveland pitcher Greg Swindell. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see here. Greg Swindell overall. An excellent seven, pitcher in his own right. Yes. Yeah, 17 years in the big leagues. Most of it with Cleveland. Seven years there. Four years in Arizona and Houston. Two in Minnesota and then Boston and Cincinnati for parts of seasons. 1989, he was an all-star. 1990, he went 12-9 and nine with a 4.40 ERA. 214 innings pitched, 245 hits, allowed 135 strikeouts, an 89 ERA plus, and a war of 1.4. Unless he was suspended multiple times that we just don't remember. (laughs) I don't think it's going to work. But uh, first round draft pick, second overall by Cleveland in the 1986 draft. He's in the College Baseball Hall of Fame. Well, that's a negative on this on this podcast, right? That's like a point and a half negative or something like that. But uh, nothing else that's going to help you out. But uh, I don't think you need it. So, uh, all right, round two to you. You're up two to one, which is rare in this this year's game. Not worried. Say. Not worried. All right, here's your next player: Red Sox pitcher, not Louis Tiant, 
Dennis Lamp. All right, Dennis Lamp. Well, I, I mean, I'm staring at his pictures here, and he always had a Louis Tiant esque mustache. Does oh, he? Yeah, in this? It's a big, bushy one. Yeah, I think there's a two tenths right off the bat there. Let's see. Overall, for uh, Dennis Lamp, he's, his last name is a noun. I mean, you got to come up with something. Overall, four years in Boston and with the Cubs, three with Toronto and the White Sox, and then Pittsburgh and Oakland. In 1987, I don't really remember that, but in 1990 with the Red Sox, he went three and five, 4.68 ERA, 105 innings pitched, 114 hits allowed, 49 strikeouts, and 87 ERA plus, and that is good for a WAR of 0.3. Plus, we've got the heavy duty mustache, so that'll be a 0.5. I am guessing that there's not going to be much pop culture from Dennis Lamp. Not a lot, but there is an interesting note here. Uh, how far away are you from Newport Beach, California? Well, I'm pretty sure that that is in Southern California. So, so if I send you this card, you can go down and get it signed because he has worked behind the seafood counter at Bristol Farms in Newport Beach since 2004. Oh, wow. What? So Newport Beach looks like it's even south of San Diego. I mean, it's, oh, okay. it's down there quite a ways. But I mean, to get a Dennis Lamp autograph. Yeah. That'd be worth it. You, well, <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. I, I'm not, I'm, okay. I'm going to look on eBay for a Dennis Lamp signed card and just see if it's worth it. Yeah. All right. So, well, first of all, there's a 88 Fleer Dennis Lamp not signed that somebody thinks somebody's going to pay $4.99 plus another four thirty six for shipping. <laughs> I think this might be part of a money laundering scam where yeah, it could be. <laughs> they're doing that. But here is a Dennis Lamp 87 Fleer with the Blue Jays that is autographed for $10. Here's an oh, here's an 87, which is my favorite, for $15 autographed. So well, if you get this 90 sign, you know, hey, 10 bucks is 10 bucks. Well, yeah, but I think it's going to cost more than 10 bucks for me to, to get down that far. Now, looking, here is a signed 78 rookie card that he shares with nobody that I've heard of. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but boy, he's got some great cards. Here's an 81 Tops card where he's got that great mustache, but he's also got those sunglasses on that are dark at the very top. But then by the time you get down to the bottom of them, they're clear. So very cool, but Hmm. all right. So I, I, that's a 0.5 for me. Who's uh, who's lamp going up against. I got a guy you might remember. And, and and very fondly, Mr. Kevin McReynolds came out for the metropolitans. Let's see. K- I, I don't know if people called him K-Mac. Oh, his nickname is Big Mac. I call him K-Mac. But overall, 12 years in the big league, six with the Mets, four with the Padres, two with the Royals. 1990 with the Mets, he appeared in 147 games as their left fielder. Hit 269, 353 on base, 24 home runs, 82 RBI, and nine stolen bases for a 121 OPS+. Plus. And that is good for a war of 3.6. Anything else on this card can help you out? No, he was always clean shaven, and let's see, I can't tell if those are real. I think those are fake stirrups. I don't. I yeah, don't think, those are fake. I don't think it's going to matter. <laughs> Unfortunately for Kevin, he was traded to the Mets in 1987, so no World Series for him there. First round draft pick, sixth overall by the Padres in 1981. He was uh, oh, he's traded for Kevin Brown and Stan Jefferson and Kevin Mitchell. So that's how the Mets got Kevin Mitchell in. I believe uh, he hit for the cycle once, too. That somehow sticks in my mind. Well, I do need to mention that he was traded with Greg Jeffries for our favorite rapping Cy Young Award winner, Brett Saberhagen, at one point. Oh, yes. So uh, he's got that going for him. Um, How about this for pop culture? He ran a commercial duck hunting club in southeast Arkansas. Well, now, if you could pull up a commercial for this commercial duck hunting club, I would give it to you. But without that, I'm going to say no, but it does not matter. You've you've easily won this round, and you are correct. He did hit for the cycle at one point. Okay, okay. Wow, another win for me. All right, you're up three to, nothing, uh, three to one, so I'm just lulling you into a false sense of security, and now we're turning it on, bringing the starters in. Now, how lucky are you to draw a second Mariners pitcher from 1990? Oh, shoot. All right. So it's going to be four to one. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to give you double mustache points for this guy, Jerry Reed. He's got two mustaches? Yeah. No, he's just got one big bushy one. <laughs> right. Let's see. Jerry Reed, overall nine years in the big league. Seattle for five, Cleveland for three, the Phillies for two, and the Red Sox for one. Let's see. In 1990, it was his final year in the big leagues. He split time between Seattle and Boston. Overall, he went 2-2 two and two with a 4.82 ERA, 52 innings pitched, 63 hits, 19 strikeouts, and 85 ERA plus. And that is good for a minus .2 war. But with the double mustache, that'll be an even zero. Is there anything else there to help me out? Um, no, nah, just the mustache. You can't see the stirrups or anything. So no such luck. All right. Well, I'm sure that he was the darling of the Seattle media while he was there and appeared in many commercials and nationally televised programs. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, well, he did play with Louis Tiant because he did play in the Senior Professional Baseball Association. Oh, there you go. We've come around full circle. Yeah, now. Uh, professional podcasting, but nothing else there. So uh, that is a goose egg for me there. Can you beat that? I think I probably can with one of the show favorites, outfielder for the Pirates, Andy Van Slyke. Andy Van Slick. Remember when he was the Mariners batting coach for like a hot minute? Yeah, I remember that because I was like, I wanted to go get an autograph, but I'm not supposed to. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, that was when I was working there, too. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. That Andy Van Slyke was there. But 13 Absolutely. years in the big leagues, eight with the Bucks, four with the why I for some reason when I see St. Louis now I automatically say Redbirds and I I I know that that's a way that you can refer to them but I don't know why I would uh, four with the Cardinals one with the Phillies and one with Baltimore 1990 with the Bucks in 136 games he hit 284 367 on base seven home run or I'm sorry 17 home runs 77 RBI 14 stolen bases and a 132 OPS plus how many career stolen bases you think slick had man i don't i don't know a hundred 245 wow from his rookie season all the way through from 1983 through 1993 he had double figures every single year hey you just don't think of andy van slyke as being that fast but i guess he was mm-hmm. He could, he could steal a base, apparently. Yeah, first-round draft pick by the Cardinals in the 79 draft. He was traded by St. Louis along with Spanky, Mike Lavalier, to the Pirates for Tony Pena. And uh, hmm. was also at one point traded for Gene Harris. Do wow. I get, do I get points for that? No, you get a nice pat on the back. Oh, well, it doesn't. Which, is, which is nice. Yeah. No, no. Um, no. So much for Van Slyke actually pursued a career as an author. Baseball Central Books. One was called Tiger Confidential, the untold inside story of the 2008 season. And another, The Curse, Cubs win, Cubs win, or do they? It, this is a book in the shub, in the shub, in the sub genre of sports fiction. Yes. A huge, <laughs> huge sub genre. <laughs> Uh, hey, I don't see anything else. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you two pop culture points for that. It doesn't matter. You won the round anyway. <laughs> Four to one. I am again. I'm just. I'm waiting. This is going to be like a, a New York Mets grand slam late in the game. All right. Well, we'll see. We've got a Royals pitcher for you, okay. Charlie Liebrandt. All right. Well, I mean, you know, I think I might get a positive score here. I don't know. Let's see, overall, 14 years in the big league, six with the Royals, four with Cincinnati, three with Atlanta, one with the Rangers. In 1990, with Atlanta, he went 9-11 and with a 3.16 ERA, 162 innings, 164 hits, 76 strikeouts, a 128 ERA plus, and that is good for a war of 3.2. Is he wow. wearing glasses or got a mustache of any sort? No, clean shaven, and he may have had LASIK surgery because no glasses. <laughs> I don't know if I, in 1990, if I would have wanted LASIK if it was around. <laughs> Overall, he uh, won one World Series in 1985, managed by Dick Hauser. With the, there you uh, go. Do I get points for that? Uh, you get a, a nice pat on the other shoulder. <sighs> well, I'm 
going to get some work done on my shoulders. I've got news for everyone. I've got slight tears in both uh, labrums, lab- labrums, wow. whatever, in my shoulder. So I'm going to go get some injections next week. So please don't. No pats on the back, please. Uh, what, what kind of injections are you getting? Uh, I can't go into anything this. Anything make is, your ears grow? I, this is, <laughs> it's not a Tommy John situation, but uh, I do have... I, I, there might be a reason why I can barely get the ball from second base to first base when I'm throwing it and in great pain. We'll see. Let's see. Charlie Liebrandt, I know that the fans were clamoring for him to hawk some merchandise, but I don't think he did. Youngest son, Brandon, played for the Marlins at one point in the big leagues. And uh, his oldest son, Ryan, is a doctor in the city of New York. Very nice. That's all I got. But uh, 3.2 for me. Who's Charlie going up against? I don't think I can beat you with San Diego Padres pitcher Eddie Whitson. He pitched forever. That's what I remember about Ed Whitson. Overall, 15 years in the big leagues. Eight with the Padres, three with the Giants and the Bucks, two with the Yankees, one with Cleveland. In 1990 with San Diego, wow, he went 14-9 and nine with a 2.6 ERA. 228 wow. innings pitched, only 215 hits, 127 strikeouts, and a 148 ERA plus. And that he led the league in war that year with no a 7.0 war. <laughs> okay, maybe I can beat you with Eddie Woods. Get this. So he was 35 in 1990. He only played one more year. The year prior, in 1989, he had a war of 6.5. Wow, Eddie was a better player than I remember. In in his 34 and 35-year-old seasons, he had a combined war of 13 and a half. His 15 season total is only 22.7. Wow. So, wow, was he suspended at any point? I guess is my only grade. Is there anything that's going to hurt you in on the card? Yeah, I believe we have fake stirrups here. Oh, uh, well that's a minus 5 now. Oh, really? (laughs) Because I really hate them. Uh, At one point, traded by the Pirates to the Giants for Bill Madlock, Lenny Randall, and Dave Roberts. Ah. A lot of names. You mentioned Dave Roberts earlier, too. Do I get points for that? (laughs) No, Mm, I don't. No pats on the back either, pal. This is kind of like, are we there yet when you're you're in the car? Uh, Nothing on the uh, pop culture front, but I, I don't think you need it. So, all right, mm. you win this. Yeah, the, looking at the scoreboard, it's now 7-11. But well, all we've done here is given all our regulars a day off. Well, you had to go and, and use your high leverage guys. So, Like Ed Whitson. Yeah, so joke's on you, buddy. Uh, okay. Next week, we will return to our regular scheduled program. But that'll do it for Wax Packs Heroes. Congratulations, Mark, on uh, getting back on the good side of the ledger. That's going to do it also for this episode as a whole. But if you want more of us, you can find us. So just Google Two Strike Noise. That is T-W-O Strike Noise on uh, Google, on Jeeves, and... Uh, <laughs> What was the God, what was the other one? The <laughs> Netscape web browser. I don't know. I, I can't remember. If you've got an AOL account, I think we're oh, prominent. Well, but on. wow! <laughs> also, you can find all this in the show notes. Also, I'm going to put the links to some to uh, to those songs that we played earlier. If you want to go watch those videos, but we also have an email address that Mark's going to tell us about, even though it is likewise in the show notes. Yes, you can write to us at two strike noise. Spell it out: T W O strike noise at gmail dot com. All right, that's going to do it. Spoiler alert for next week. We have a former Major League Baseball player who has contacted us that wants to come on the show for the second time. So we've already contacted the the doctors in the city where this player resides because something is clearly wrong with them. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's all we're going to say, though. But we've got somebody that we really enjoyed talking to the first time. They'll be back with us for a bit next week. Open some bait. Well, you know what, Mark? We're not going to play next week because we're going to open cards with our guests. So. That's true. Yes, yeah. so we'll can, have a, a exhibition game. Yeah, you can you can savor. So my guys, see, it's like given. I was given my guys a day off before an off day, so they're really rested for the second half of the season. You keep telling yourself that, pal. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that'll do it for us. We'll see you on the next episode of Two Strike Noise. Thank you. God bless you. Michelle, have Michelle, a great day. Michelle, 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 Michelle. Young girl, stranger, riding journey from Milan to Miss Young.
Rochelle, 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 Rochelle.